At this hour, fires are still burning on the south side of Minneapolis after protesters took to the streets to demand justice for George Floyd. There are some protests happening uh, down outside the Capitol. Uh, they appear to be Trump supporters who are frustrated with the outcome and are trying to breach some of that perimeters around the Capitol. Father, make them one as you and I are one, which means diversity was the seed to see if we would lay down our culture and pick up the kingdom. And that's why this conversation is important. But their Jesus is gun-toting and Republican, and black Jesus is Democrat and liberal. And the truth is, Jesus is neither because he wasn't political, he was monarchy, he was spiritual. Right? And so we need to deal with Jesus as he is. Anybody ready for the word of the Lord today? If you'll do me a kindness and out of respect for the word and reverence for the word, if you'd stand one more time to our visitors um, who are here for the first, second, or third time, uh, I want to welcome you again. Uh, I am grateful that you would choose to worship the Lord Jesus with us today. I am grateful. God is doing something significant in our church right now, something very major that I can't actually articulate in, in the way that I would like to, but I'm grateful that you're here. My prayer is that this word will give you the clarity that you need to make some decisions with your life. Yeah. This is a critical moment for you in your destiny. You can't mess up right now. There's too much at stake. Yeah. Your family's name, your legacy is right here in front of you. And in the next 45 days, God is gonna give you the foundational plans for what is to come. I want to tell you what 2023 is about, but you're going to have to just show up on New Year's Eve. By the way, New Year's Eve is on a Saturday this year. We're having watch night service. We will not have morning service the next morning because Jesus ain't called for no midnight service and then an 8 o'clock service. That ain't never been Jesus. So we need all of you and your cousins to be in here. You don't need to be out there anyway. They shooting, they, kill, they taking your car. They out here in these streets. You might as well be in here with Jesus and then get some French toast sticks over there and, <laughs> and some bacon, which my wife told me is not pork. It's not pork, but ham is. And it's from the same animal. I'm praying for your mind. In Matthew chapter 16, um, and actually, here's the thing. I'm, I'm reading this. Nephew, I need you to go to Colossians chapter 1. Everybody's going to Colossians chapter 1, starting at the ninth verse, Colossians chapter 1. I need to say that I'm really encouraged this morning because I see a lot of young men, young teenage men. I see them in here, and it blesses my heart. I see my guys with their hoodies on. I see my man with a Cleveland Browns hat. I'm praying for him. Cincinnati Bengals all day. You got to take that. Head off, cuz. You understand what I'm saying, cuz? La da 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 da. Mm -mm -mm. Colossians chapter 1. You're going to Colossians 1. I'm reading uh, from Colossians 1, but Matthew 16 and 3, Jesus asks a question. I brought it up last week. I'm going to bring it up again. He says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the people closest to him could not come to a consensus. Isn't it interesting that you can be in the presence of Jesus and not even recognize Jesus? They were with him, but couldn't see him. And how many people are in your life that are with you, around you, and near you, but can't see you? Can't see what you carry. Can't see your calling. And even if they see it, they really try to ignore it because they don't want to acknowledge and embrace the fact that you are called to something different and bigger than the current construct of your life. And you are frustrated because you know you are called to more and you have not been able to access it. But I'm telling you that the governors are being removed from your life so that you can finally run with the level of passion and vigor and vitality that is connected to your name. There are no more hindrances. I need that to get in your spirit. This is on me this morning. I sense the prophetic mantle on my shoulders. I may call you out if I do stand up and receive the word of the Lord, but I'm telling 
telling you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that God is removing the restrictions. If there's anybody in here who's ever watched NASCAR, there's something called restrictor plates that hinder the, the engine from going past a certain level of horsepower to make the playing field level. I need you to know God's taking the restrictor plate off because the playing field is not level. God's about to breathe on your life and he's about to favor your concern. I wish I had some help in here. Who do you say that I am? They go on and John the Baptist and Elijah and one of the prophets, he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You upon this rock, not you, Peter, you're not the rock. The revelation is the rock. No person is the foundation of the church. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the unique, anointed, only begotten son of the father who is the head of the church. And upon that revelation, I will build my church. Any other revelation, any other uh, dogma, any other religious construct is not the foundation of the church. It is Jesus, Elder Linton, and Jesus alone. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. He said it was his church, personal, possessive pronoun. It's my church. It's not the church of politics. It is not the church of color or culture. It is my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Jesus instituted this over 2,000 years ago in a Middle Eastern portion of, 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 uh, of near the edge of Africa going into uh, this other part that is now what we call the Middle East. So anywhere in that area, you want to look, you want to understand that from the cultural specificity of Jesus, he was not looking like us in the sense of Americans. You cannot have a, a true picture of Jesus if you only see him through the lens of your color or your construct or your community. Jesus existed at a certain place at a certain time and he interacted with certain people based on the culture of the day. But somehow by the power of a life well lived, his life was able to translate to every nation, tribe, and language. That is the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through Jesus. So now we're in Colossians. Let me help you with this scripture, and then you can sit down, because some of y'all are like, this is 45 minutes already. Colossians chapter 1, starting at the ninth verse. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. Tell somebody, walk worthy. Walk worthy. They, they weren't looking at you. She was too busy braiding her hair. Tell her I said, walk worthy. Walk worthy. <laughs> walk worthy of the Lord. Watch this. Fully pleasing him. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God. You can't and you should not go to a church that you are not growing in the things of God. There are people who come up to me in multiple places around the country and even in this area here. Some people have said, oh, you know what? I watch you on Sunday. I love you. I really want to go to my church. I want to come to the church, but I, I, I've been at my other church for X amount of years and, you know, my family goes there and I'm like, hey, listen, that's between you and God, but I'm not going to let religion or family or anything keep me in a place where I'm not growing. Because all you're doing is setting yourself back and you're going to end up resenting the people that you allowed to be gods in your life to make you stay in a place you know you've outgrown. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
I know I'm preaching. I know it's a lot of scripture. I need you to stay with me. We, we're so used to microwave church that when we got some oven cooked goodness, it's, it's, it's hard to wait. Here we go. You ready? He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Beautiful. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah for the blood. Is anybody grateful for the blood? Watch this. He is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. He is the he is the image of the invisible God. You want to know God's personality? Look at Jesus. You want to know how God would deal with you in, in, in the form of, of, of humanity? Look at Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There is no God junior. He is God. He was in a body. He laid down his divinity so that he could take on our humanity so that when he intercedes at the right hand of the Father, he knows what he's talking about because he's been through what you've been through. The Bible says that Jesus was in all points tempted yet was without sin. So you can't go to God and say, you don't understand that I'm struggling in the day in this area or that area. Jesus says, no, I struggled with it too. They were throwing their tail at me too. They were offering me money too. They were trying to get me to do X, Y, and Z too. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit, I was able to walk in obedience and honor the Father. But I know the frailty of the human condition, so I'm going to intercede to my Father who is seated to my left because I'm at the right hand of power. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Get this in your spirit. Nobody in this earth has power. No one in the earth has power that they created or that they conveyed on themselves. All power is in the hands of Jesus. All power is in the hands of Jesus. And all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The title of this message is We Are the Church, part two. You may be seated. Father, as they're sitting down, bless this word and get the glory out of this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, election day was Tuesday. How many people here participated in, in the election process? Amen. Keep your hands up, and you should, because... The, 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 the right to vote was not always accessible to a large portion of the people in this nation, whether it was women's suffrage or the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. You do know that the Voting Rights Act did not pass until the 60s. There are people that are alive right now who were there when that happened. Nothing, I think you should absolutely participate as long as you understand that Jesus still has all power. You can put your hands down. Now, everybody was worried. Let's be honest. I, I, I do want a little bit of conversation today. Let's be honest. There were people that you had conversations with, not you, because you're fully confident in God's power. You weren't worried at all. But there were some people that you had conversations with that were worried about how the power structure was going to shift. People were worried about the election. How many people had concerns that the country might act a fool? I did. I'm just going to be honest. And what happened? Not nothing. Terrible English, terrible grammar, double negative, not one thing. And what happened in the Senate? It's still divided. Democrats still have control of the Senate. Oh, my Jesus. Republicans will have the House. Oh, my Jesus. The president will still be a Democrat. Oh, my Jesus. The Supreme Court. Oh, my Jesus. And God is still... 
God on the throne. And he is still the sovereign over the affairs of men and women. And God is not shocked or moved by what's happening in the United States as if we are the only nation in the world. He's got 8 billion people to worry about. So the 400 million plus that live here, that's just one part. He's got entire continents to feed. People were worried and oh my God, will Mehmet Oz win the, the Senate so we can get control of the Senate and there are a lot of sad evangelicals this morning because we didn't take the Senate. And people are like, we're at war. It's the culture war. And they get real, real loud about all of the big issues and, and gay marriage and abortion and all of these things. And you need to live this because that's what the Bible says. You got to be real careful when you start throwing Bibles at secular institutions because it is not a theocracy. This is a representative republic. And so you cannot legislate morality. Why well, it's real quiet. We are at war, but it ain't with culture. And that's the problem with church. The moment you put yourself against culture, you're no longer relevant to it. Dag, I'm preaching better than you're. Anyway, the moment you want to talk about them, you lost them. You're not at war with culture. You're at war with the devil. Will anybody wake up in here and hear what I'm saying? Why you want to talk about how people are living and the choices they make and why you're telling them don't do this and do that. Have you followed every single law that's in the Old Testament? Have you followed every precept in the New Testament? Because if you have not, it would be best for you to hush about other people's lives and make sure that you're doing what the Bible asks you to do. And if you focus on you and your house, you'll find you have very little time to worry about what other people are doing in their house. I'll go for an eight second praise break to the Lord. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Well, what are you saying, Pastor? You saying people should live how they want? Of course not. What I'm saying is people are going to live how they want. People are going to do what they want every day. People were all up and through all of them stadiums yesterday. They sleep this morning because they was up for 12, 13, 15 hours yesterday barbecuing, went to the game, sat in traffic. They ain't coming to church. But if you ask them if they love Jesus, oh, absolutely. You know why? Because people do what they want. So the moment you try to legislate morality through your religious construct, you miss the fact that Jesus said, give Caesar what's Caesar and give to God's what's God's. Woo. All right. So the church wants to be at war with culture and you're missing the fact that you're called to love and influence culture, not be at war with it. You're at war with devils principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. You can't lose sight that your neighbor is not your enemy. Satan is. I'll say it again. Your neighbor is not your enemy. Satan is your enemy. Now, does the enemy influence people? Absolutely. But understanding the influence of spirits on people and understanding the spirit is the root of that thing, then you don't attack the person, you pray against the demon. But if you don't understand spiritual things, you'll start yelling at people and you need to do you, you, you. No, 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 no. You need to elevate your prayer beyond their forehead and into that spiritual area and say, I bind that devil and that principality in this region. And then you might have to fast and pray like Daniel. It might take you three weeks, but Michael will show up and open the atmosphere and clear all of that out. Somebody scream, we are the church. Are the church. Hashtag W-A-T-C. We are the church. If you're going to post, hashtag that sucker. We are the church. I'm so tired of us being divided by denomination and color and construct. And it's only one church. 
So the scripture that I shared out of Colossians 1 makes it clear. Who is the head of the church? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. We don't hear enough about Jesus on Sunday mornings anymore. Because there are too many people with microphones that need to get their agenda out. They want to get their personality out. They want to get their brand out. And because they want to get their brand and their personality and their agenda, we're not hearing much about Jesus these days. And the reason why we don't see the miracle signs and wonders that the Bible says the church is supposed to enjoy is because we have not made it clear who the head of the church is. We've got factions and fractions and people who are jockeying for position and they want to sit here and they need a mic there and they need a name tag here and they want to be famous over there. And if I don't like you, I want you to not like them too and you need to take them playground antics from fifth grade and grow up you are 40 years old you still doing dumb stuff would you please grow up and if you can't grow up then grow out of here 13 and a half second praise break while you're seated shout we are the church The word preeminence in this scripture in Colossians is the Greek word protuo. It means to be first or to hold first place, protuo, the preeminent one. And we don't talk about Jesus like we need to. I feel the Holy Ghost on me because every time I say his name, some demon somewhere is bowing down. Jesus, the head of the church, Jesus the savior of the world, Jesus, the head of the church, Jesus, the king of kings, Jesus, who as he died, saved a thief next to him while the sign over his head was in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, signifying the top languages of the day, saying around the world, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And one of the Pharisees got mad and say, I need you to put on the sign he said he's the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Even people who don't believe are going to have to acknowledge who you are. I need somebody in here to come on and run with me. This is not going to be a long sermon because today is a pep rally to remind you that you are a part of a body that cannot be killed because Jesus said no devil in hell is going to stop my church. But the moment the devil tries it, you've got authority over serpents and scorpions to trample on the head of the enemy. Now he'll bruise your heel, but you're going to bruise his head. He might slow you down, but you're going to crush him under your feet. I need somebody in here to wake up. If you want a lecture, go to a university. But today I got to preach it like I feel it. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Everybody in here give the Lord a praise. Give the Lord. Give the Lord. And as a matter of fact, I want you to act a fool right now. I want you to go ham crazy in your house, scare your neighbor, wake up Mrs. Johnson next door and shout to the Lord in that house. You got cereal in your bowl. Some people don't even have a meal to eat. You ought to thank him. You had heat this morning. You ought to thank him. You had gas in the car. You ought to thank him. You had a choice of what to put on. You ought to thank him. Don't you come in here like God owes you something. We owe God everything and we'd have nothing if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, if it wasn't for the person of Jesus, if it wasn't for the power of Jesus, the devil would have already killed us. The only reason you're alive is because God's holding devils back like this. That's why his arms were outstretched on the cross to keep devils from getting to you. You don't even know how many devils he's kept you from, how many times he kept you alive, how many times death was over you while you were asleep, and the Holy Ghost snatched that devil out the room, told the spirit of death, not now, not from this, not here, not that baby, not that mother, not that husband, not that wife, no, 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 God kept you.
to run alone. She doesn't need to run alone. Somebody else in here needs to feel that thing stirring up in you. The only reason you're here is because of the goodness of Jesus. I'm tired of people being casual with the love that has been shared for you. We show our emotion everywhere else except here. Really? After everything God has done for you, you can't even shout him out in his own house? I'm not telling you to do this at work. It may not be appropriate, but they got a bathroom at that job. I dare you to go in there and just go crazy in the stall. They don't know what's going on. It just But you don't have any restriction like that in here. You might as well go for God. Put it in the chat feed. Go for God. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Did you hear what I said? Get his name on your mouth. Get his name on your lips. Get his name in your heart. Get his name in your spirit. Stop worrying about what people are saying, what people are doing, what's going on in government. You should be aware, but don't worship at the altar of CNN and Fox News and MSNBC. Worship at the altar of the one that has all power. Somebody shout his name like you need him. You don't know what he kept you from. Yesterday, my family was in Dothan, Alabama for the National Peanut Festival. If you don't know about it, look it up. 50,000 people a night on a fairground with the most cholesterol-enriched food you've ever had in your life. And the rides are held together by duct tape and bubble gum. You got to pray in the Holy Ghost for the, for the ride to even work. But it's amazing. On Saturday, they have a parade. Every year that we've been able to go, my wife wants to go to the parade. The door, now, the Lord told me no, because I'm tired. I'm tired. Normally, the kids want to go. They didn't want to go. Yesterday... There was a shooting, and somebody lost their lives. One of her friend's sons lost his life, and a young girl was also shot, but she survived. My kids and wife and me were supposed to be right there, but God... How many times has God done that for you and you never knew it? You said, I'll just sleep a little longer. I'll take a different way home. Maybe I'll stop off here. And you missed the car accident by one second. You missed the moment, the tragedy by one second. You don't know what God is doing and you ought to give God a praise for every time he's kept you from danger seen and unseen. Somebody here to get out of them seats and you ought to give God a shout. Hey! Hey! God kept you! God kept you! Oh, God!
kept your kids. He kept your life. It should have been over. But God said no. It was your turn according to the devil. But it wasn't your turn according to his will. God said no. Kept you from a virus. You know you did it. There was no protection. The condom broke. But God kept you. You didn't get a disease that would kill you. You ought to thank him. God kept you. You used to do drugs. You got a bad dose. And you're still alive. God kept you. You had cancer. But cancer couldn't have you. God kept you. You ought to thank him. I know you wanted that person. But they are crazy. They would have killed you. God kept you. He kept you because that's what he does when you're a part of the family. That's what he does when you're washed in the blood. Somebody in here, somebody about to take off in here. You're covered because the blood has kept you. Don't do it. Somebody shout, we are the church. And people come in here half behind in it. Come in looking at their watch. During worship looking at their watch. Talking and distracted. And the very God that saved you is waiting for you to just give him five minutes of your attention. Some of us treat God like the prom date we didn't really want. We take her, but we don't pay her no attention. God says, you're not going to treat me like that. You don't take me to the red roof end. I'm not, I'm not the side piece. I'm the preeminent one. I'm first. I'm the best. That's why tithe is not about giving 10%. It's the first 10% because I'm the first I'm also the last. That's why if you give me what's first, I'll make what you have left last. I feel the Holy Ghost, Buchanan. God kept him because he's got a purpose because you prayed. Anyway. Some of y'all don't understand. Some of y'all are alive because your mama wouldn't shut up. Kept praying. Kept throwing your name up in the air. God, keep my baby. I know he's acting a fool, but God, you got a purpose for it. God, keep my daughter. She's dating a complete fool. Keep her, God. And if you got to take him, take him, but leave her. Somebody shout, we are the church. Shout, we are the church. Yeah, let her shout. There's going to be a lot of freedom in here in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> well, pastor, what is the church? I'm glad you asked me. Before we say what the church is, we also need to talk about what the church is not. You ready? I'm glad because I got them written down. You ain't going to be able to type. You're going to have to go watch this message. Let her shout. Don't take her out. Don't. Why do we always fan people who shout? It's okay, baby. Just, I love it. Let her shout right there. I want that sound because it, it disrupts demons. That's a sound of freedom. It, we need more people. To, oh, God. Oh, God. Undignified in this.
For this gospel I live. For this gospel I'll die. There's too many men in here playing it easy, taking it safe. You need to fight and war in the spirit in your house. Your wife don't need to be the prayer warrior, you do. Get up before the rest of the family get on your face. Try it for one week. See if God don't turn everything around in that house. That's easy for you. You a preacher. No, it's not easy. I got the same fight you got. Get up. And before you slide your work shoes on, get on your face. Say, God, cover my house. Give me wisdom for my family. Give me vision for my wife and my kids. Help me, God, to be a better man today than I was yesterday. Amen. That was 12 seconds of prayer. Change your whole life. Somebody say, we are the church. No, say it like you mean to say, we are the church. So before I tell you what the church is, my man, I got to tell you what the church is not. Number one, the church is not a club. It's not an exclusionary place. The church doesn't exist for insecure communicators and those who aren't called to have a place to air their grievances. The church is not to be a safe place for hate or sin or partisan politics. The church must not be sullied by mistruths and falsehoods in order to prop up a false economy predicated upon fear and misinformation being manipulated for your money, but have no desire to get you to Jesus. The church must not conform to societal standards of what is cool and what is not. Nothing worse than a church trying to be cool, trying to catch up with the world. You're not called to catch up with the world. You're called to influence culture, not mimic it. Oh, Lord, help me. Help me, help me, Jesus. Oftentimes, if you have trouble in the church, the distance between the person of Jesus and the personality, the personality of the preacher is where you have trouble. How many people call themselves Christians in here? I'm just asking. If you're a Christian, stand up. If you call yourself a Christian, stand up. Is there anything in your life that looks like Jesus? Does your relationship look like Jesus? Do your finances look like Jesus? You call yourself a Christian. Would anyone else call you that? You call yourself a blood-washed believer. Would anyone else mistake you for Jesus. Oh, well, Pastor, you know, well, now, now hold on a minute. That's the conversation. Because when I say we are the church, if Jesus Christ is the head of the church, then his personality must become your personality. Then the things that he loves, you need to love. The things that he hates, you need to hate. And the way he treated people is the way you need to treat people. There's all, you can sit down. The tension between the person of Jesus and the personality of the pastor is where a lot of stuff gets lost in the church. But God is getting rid of all of that. I want you to hear me, and if you can grab some of these notes, great. If not, you need to go back and watch this message. But the church is a community of like-minded individuals who recognize their frailties and shortcomings and have fallen at the feet of Jesus for hope, healing, forgiveness, freedom, deliverance, provision, and direction. The church is not to be a safe place to... The church is to be a safe place to ask questions and to be vulnerable without judgment. The church is to be a place of nurturing and celebration as we grow in grace. The church is to be a place of reverential honor 
of the power of the Most High God, fully persuaded that the God of Scripture is the God of my everyday life and the God of my everyday issues. That God cares about me. Somebody say, that God. The God who split red seas. That God. Say, that God. That God who opened blinded eyes. Say, that God. That God that has four and 20 elders and 10,000 upon 10,000 angels all bowing down. That God. Somebody say, that God. That God who showed up to Job in a whirlwind and spoke to him out of a tornado and said, brace yourself like a man and I will ask you questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where, who you talking to? You ain't talking to a man. I'm the most high God. No one has ever seen me. Even the angels who worship me don't look at me when they do it. They got two wings and they cover their face, but they still worship and they still fly. They cover their feet and their face because you can't be in my, in my presence with your feet on stuff. That's why I told Moses take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground even the angels got to cover their feet let me tell you something I'm God to angels I'm God to men I'm God when you acknowledge me I'm God when you not I don't need your worship because I don't need anything I have no deficiency in myself I am self-contained self-sustained and I have always existed I'm not old but I'm ancient Oh, Lord. The church is to be a place of correction and adjustment of character so as to line up with the person of Jesus Christ and his lived out mandate of honoring God in our bodies and eschewing any look of impropriety or unholiness. Tell somebody the standard hasn't changed. Say it again. The standard hasn't changed. I know we're in a new age where you can kind of live how you want and still be saved, and you can do what you want, and still be saved, and it's all kinds of people who are pastors and preachers, ain't thinking about God, living how they want. Let me tell you something, the standard hasn't changed, but what did the Bible say? Let the wheat and tear grow up. I will gather them, and I'm gonna burn up the tear with unquenchable fire. What's funny is while they're growing, they look the same. But at the point of maturity, there is a distinct difference between wheat and tear. So just listen, don't, don't judge, don't, don't do anything crazy. You just keep being wheat and watch the Lord rip the tear. I'm, I'm high-fiving myself because y'all playing with me. Let me make this clear about holiness. Holiness is not behavioral, it's spiritual. It's a heart posture. I live to please God, not to impress people. I live to please God, not to impress people. Holiness as a denomination is designed to make you think that I'm closer to God because I wear all white. I wear long skirts. I have on white stockings and nurse's shoes. Therefore, I'm holiness. Biggest freaks in the church will outtwerk anybody on the ground. And here's the problem. You can't have external holiness without an internal work. Holiness is not about what you wear. Holiness is about your love for God and your obedience to God because you want to please God, not people. Because there are people with flip-flops and shorts on that live holy. You don't have to wear a suit to church to be holy. You don't have to wear a long dress and not wear makeup to be holy. You sitting up trying to be so holy and your husband don't find you attractive because you think that no makeup is somehow getting you closer to God when all that is is a wedge that the devil is using to block your blessing. If, honey, if you want to put on makeup, put on all the makeup you want. There is no sin in that. Ooh, it's got real tight in here. And don't judge people based on external things. How many times? does God have to teach you stop judging a book by its cover some of us have missed our blessing because you looked at the wrapping and didn't open it up to see what's in the box oh lord on the same level some of us just married the box and got and opened the box and it was empty 
just married a fine box. Just, hello, hello, hello. Just empty. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The church is not a lecture series. It's not a place for professorial declarations. You know, when I look at the Septuagint and the Pentateuch and I look at the Masoretic text and the Vulgate, and I study this in its original Hebrew lexicon with the Greek, you don't care and don't know. And I love you. <laughs> He's like, what, is you, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the moment I try to enthrall you with my acumen, I've lost the heart of Jesus. The moment I attempt to impress you with my didactic ability to put together verbs, nouns, phrases, and clauses, when I try to impress you with my academia, it's the moment the Holy Spirit leaves and says, he got it. Because it is the foolishness of the gospel. Oh, Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. The church is not a lecture series. It is a living place where the supernatural occurs on the regular. Did you hear what I said? We had two prayer emphases last week. It was two names. Anybody remember the two names I asked you to pray for? Egypt and Amari. Anybody pray for them like I asked? Seven of us. Bless your heart. The rest of them. And this is, and this is an admonition. If you can't even pray for two names, perhaps that's why you haven't seen breakthrough in your own life. Because you can't even be consistent for a week. Good. I'm glad you didn't like it. Change it. Pray every day till you see that thing break. And if you really want to take your prayers up, thank the Lord for stuff that ain't here. Thank him for it every day like it's there. You know what, Lord? I thank you for my new job. I'm glad that it not only pays my bills, but I can save money. Matter of fact, Lord, I'm making, I'm making enough. I'm saving half and my bills are still paid. You need to talk like that. Thank you. I just need one person to agree with me. The church is a place of signs and wonders, not trade and commerce. <laughs> I asked the Lord to make me independently wealthy so that I wouldn't need the resources of the church to do anything for my family because I want to be a completely independent voice. I ain't scared of nobody anyway, but I want to be able to take care of my family without ever needing anything from this church. I want to pour into the church. I want to pay off the church by myself. I want, I want to do it. I want to do it. To give a black eye to every devil that, that took out my cousins and took out my father. You understand? I got a personal vendetta against that devil because I lost family members behind religious bull crap. I lost a father who couldn't get free because he would not turn and give his life to Jesus because they wouldn't accept him because of different things that he was struggling with. So he struggled with heroin addiction. So what? He struggled with gambling. So what? He went to jail a few times. Matter of fact, killed somebody. But that's my daddy. That's why I'm saying, don't push me. I got some killer in my blood. Just leave me alone. Leave my family alone. I'm just saying. I love Jesus. That's a side note. I'm back to the word. My point is this. I have a personal vendetta against the devil because of what he's done in my family. So I'm not really preaching for you. I'm preaching because I know where I came from. And I'm preaching because I know he wants to take me out like he took all the other men out. But every time I'm in my house praying for my family, paying bills and raising my kids and loving my wife. Every day I do it, I give the devil another black eye. And I'm not the only one. I know we got one right there. I'm tired of y'all sitting down. Somebody needs to stand up and make some daggone noise in here. The church is not a place for your failed business to try to get your thing off, pastor, <laughs> preacher. Jesus turned the tables over in the temple because they had turned the house of God into a den of thieves. Am I saying that God is not pro-business? He is. I didn't say that. I said the church 
we shouldn't only be about money. The church was never about money. But make no mistake, you go too far to one side and you'll say, God doesn't want you to have wealth. That's a lie. That's stupid. And you haven't read the word. Because he says with wealth, riches, and long life, shall I honor you? If you obey, keep my commandments and live a life of wisdom. I know people want to shame you because you want to have nice things. Nice things is not the issue. Your heart is the issue. God wants his church to be without any other agenda except declaring Jesus is Lord. Anything that doesn't line up with that should not be in the pulpit. Can we agree on that? We are called to do three things, to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to lead like Jesus. For the six people taking notes, that means you're taking this seriously. I'm going to say it again, and don't make me come out there. You're called to love like Jesus, live like Jesus, and lead like Jesus. How did Jesus love? He loved completely, had compassion on everybody, healed everybody. Not just believers, but non-believers. Not just people who would celebrate him, but people who would later reject him. He knew who was going to reject him. He knew who was going to be in the crowd screaming, crucify him, and he still put hands on him. Still laid hands, still healed them, still delivered. He's sitting there talking to the 12 disciples. He said, there's a time coming when you will leave me all alone, but I am not alone, for my Father is with me. But he still poured into him for three and a half years. Poured into Judas every single day, knowing Judas was full of the devil, but still gave him a chance to change. If you want to love like Jesus, it's going to hurt. You want to live like Jesus, it's going to cost you. And you want to lead like Jesus, they're going to hurt you again. Because people will leave you for what they think is the next big thing. And you need to be okay with that. And you need to stay focused on what God called you to do. If the relationship didn't work, it's because God didn't want it to. It's real quiet, but I know I'm talking right. Live, love, and lead like Jesus. And we are called to be filled with unshakable faith, filled with compassion, never wavering from sound doctrine. Did you hear what I said? Never wavering from sound doctrine. The moment I start shifting, if I ever shift, I say, well, there, you know, there's other ways to get to God. Get out of here. Run. We've got a bunch of preachers now that are more ecumenical than spiritual because you want to be popular and cool and you want to sell things and you want to be famous. But Jesus made himself of no reputation. Here's the greatest preacher and leader who ever lived, had no marketing team. You know who marketed him? Heaven. This is my beloved son. You want, you want to talk about marketing and promotion? When heaven starts talking to the earth, I need you to know God knows how to breathe on your business. He knows how to breathe on your idea. He knows how to breathe on that thing that you need. God knows how to speak. You just need to be obedient. The issue is not the head. The issue is the body. The head is fine. The body is misaligned. It's time for a spiritual chiropractic appointment where God readjusts the spine of the church because our spine is crooked. And we've been limping around culture asking for culture to tell us who we are. We need to get our back cracked so we can stand up straight and say, I don't care if you like me or hate me, Jesus is Lord. I don't care if you ever walk in here again, I'm still going to preach Jesus. You can keep your money if you get offended by what I say as long as I lifted up Jesus. Everyone is standing. We are the church. To my young boys, to my young men in hoodies who I see throughout. I just want you to know I see you. I need you to hear me say that again. I see a Phi Beta Sigma in the house. I just want you to know I see you, King. 
I see all the men of God. I see the mighty women of God. But I need this to be clear. As I see these young men, I see the future. And the enemy doesn't want our young people to feel like they have access or advocacy from this pulpit. But I used to be you. I was 13. Be like, when is church going to be over? I want to go home and play Atari. Some of y'all don't know what that is. How many people remember Atari? Having to just hush. She over there talking about a little bit. I got her by eight years, eight and a half years. It's eight and a half, hater. It's eight and a half. You will be 40. I'm 40. No, you'll be 41 in five minutes, and it'll be eight years between us. I'm preaching anyway. What I'm saying is this. You and your braids. Next time wear a jacket, got your shoulders out. Nobody playing with you. Holiness. <laughs> like, but then you say it don't matter what you... That was for y'all. Well, traipsing out here. I'm not doing it. It's time for the church to grow a spine and stand up for what's right. To stand for the poor people. To stand with the homeless. To stand with the broken. To open the doors of this church to the ones that uh, certain segments of religious thought throw away. Mm. I don't know if this is a place for you because you had an abortion. Sir, some of the pastors on your staff. You should be real quiet before they start pulling receipts. Everybody should just shut up. I'm so serious. Keep your mouth off, people, because you don't know when the Lord going to pull the curtain back on you. If you are human, you are welcome in this building. People get offended. What, 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 wait, wait, what, what, what does that actually mean? <laughs> what I said. For God so loved the world. Don't even finish the rest of the thing. He loved the world. So you want to throw people away because your preferred lens is offended. What does that mean? What if a man comes in with lipstick on? Well, tell him it's popping. I don't know. Leave him alone. It's not your business. He didn't ask you to put it on. I was at a church man had on full dress, killing him. Wig. Killing him. Singing in the choir. And everybody got quiet at Relentless. <laughs> like, what you about to say? <laughs> My point is this. You don't know how he got there. And just because you think your junk don't stink, you'd be surprised who God receives worship from. For all have sinned and fallen of the glory of God. If you are human, you are welcome here. The Holy Spirit will change you. Because you judging this person over here, but you sleeping with the earth. And just because you didn't get pregnant, you think you got away. Nobody gets away. God sees it all. Oh, if the church would just bow down, worship at the altar, and love people, maybe, just maybe, we would see revival. And that is the church. Yeah. 
If you're here and you want to be a part of what God is doing at this church, I invite you to meet me at the front of this altar. The altar is a bloody place if you study scripture. The altar is a place of death. You die to yourself. It's a place of sacrifice. There are no clean altars. If the altar is clean, there was no worship. Woo. The worship was in the blood. That's when you knew it was a good service. How much blood we got to clean up out of here? But today you don't have to shed blood. The blood has already been shed and it's been applied. If you want to be a member of this church or you want to get saved for the first time, join me right here. Meet me. I know somebody got to join today. I preached. I preached good today. <laughs> I'm just having fun when I say that. I believe there's a gentleman walking and I believe we need to celebrate what God is doing. He's not the only one. Other people need to make a move. I need y'all to celebrate what God is doing. There are some other people that need to make a move to this altar, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again. Some of you are saying, well, I don't really know, you know, because I got a lot of stuff I've been going through and stuff I'm dealing with, and you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still out there. I'm, I still, I, I smoke weed. I, listen, that don't have nothing to do with your salvation. The Bible says he's high and lifted up. You already high, so get lifted up. <laughs> Come on down. Puff, puff, pass. That's what I heard. I ain't never smoked. I never smoked. Some people have experimented when they were younger. I'm not pointing no fingers. Somebody else needs to be at this altar other than this man. He's not the only person. Make a move. Young man, come on. Don't, don't wait. You know I'm talking to you. Woman of God. I need somebody to make a move. I need somebody to pray. Is there anybody praying for salvations today? Ask the person next to you, are you sure you're saved? Are you sure? Ask them and wait for an answer. If he's like, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think I'm sure. If he said, I think I'm sure, bring him down. Let's just make sure you're sure. Yesterday, a young man, 18 years old, dead. He would give anything to be alive today. Oh, he was 22, still too young. Takeoff was 28. There we go. Who else? Are y'all over there talking to each other? Did you ask? Y'all come on over here. Anybody else? That's a fresh hoodie, my man. Is anybody else coming? Is anybody else coming? Is anybody else coming? If you're online and you're saying, I want to be a part, Pastor, you're as much a part of this moment as the people that are at this altar. You can text the word SAVED to 95555. You can text the word MEMBER to 95555. I'm gonna pray and I want you all to pray along with the two amazing mighty men of God who have come forward today. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, it's me. 
I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I receive the free gift of salvation, not through my works, but the finished work of the cross. The blood is enough to pay for all my sins. Now, Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me how to be more like Jesus each and every day. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of faith. Welcome to Relentless Church. Let me shake this man's hand. Thank you, man of God. Listen, this is what I want. I don't normally do this, but in a moment, we're go they're going to walk. We're going to get some information from the two of you. After we do the benediction, I would like for everyone here to remain for two minutes. I want to share something with you, okay? After we do the benediction, the cameras are going to pre-post-service. I just want to talk to you for a couple minutes. I want to encourage you in something. So let's celebrate our brothers as they go. Come on, let's celebrate them. Is this your son? Biggest day of his life. His whole destiny got unlocked today. Come on, y'all. Mr. President, God is doing something great in our midst. I love this church. We love this church. We thank you for your continued love and commitment to this house. And tomorrow night, six o'clock, the door is open for Relentless Got Talent. It's gonna be amazing. Listen, come and enjoy. Let's get together as family. It's a lot going on in the world. Come laugh, come chill, all right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord our God be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. We love you, Rock Online family. We love you so much, and we'll see you next week.